Our scripture reading this morning is 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 1 through 15. Saul lived for one year, then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Gibeah, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it, said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered the fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sands on the seashore in multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and holes and rocks in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the ford of the Jordan uh, to the land of Gad and and Gilead. And Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. The people were scattering from him. And Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the day appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself, and I offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, in which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you, And Samuel arose and went up to Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. This is the word of God. To Dean Sweeney and all distinguished faculty and alumni, as well as current students and guests. It is my sincere pleasure and honor to be invited back to a place who has given to me so much and the well from which I continue to drink deeply from that is Beeson Divinity School is not even close to running dry. I bring you all glad tidings from Fellowship Bible Church in Roswell, Georgia. And as I told Dr. Smith a little bit earlier, it is good to be home. In 2005, Alex Hitchens taught us what it meant to stay in our lane. Will Smith, of course, is playing Alex Hitchens, who is the matchmaker Hitch, of which the movie is entitled. And he's in a scene with a gentleman teaching him how to dance. Kevin James as Albert is seeking to win the affection of a woman who is far out of his league. Speaking of which, my wife is outside of those doors. In this particular scene, Hitch is trying to teach him how to dance. And he tells him, you have a lane. You need to stay in it. This is your lane. (laughs) 
nothing more and nothing less. If you do nothing else, you stay in your lane. But as the movie goes on and develops, you understand that Hitch was actually wrong. Because it wasn't the moves that Albert learned that constituted his lane. As the movie develops, you realize it's the, move, it's the moves that are in him that constitute his lane. And had he continued to try to replicate what someone else did, he would have been out of his lane. This is true of us as well. When we attempt to replicate the giftings of others within ourselves, and are not faithful to who God called us to be, we get out of our lane. And when we fail to be faithful, we find ourselves in a very embarrassing position. I spent the first seven years of my preaching ministry trying to preach like my heroes. And I was a very poor imitation of them and a less than faithful representation of who God made me to be. I failed to do what Dr. Smith taught us, which was turn the ink into blood. Sure, model, sure, admire, but it has to be your voice. We cannot be carbon copies of other people. And when I consider that God has a purpose and a plan and ministers and pastors a part of that plan, if we fail to stay in our lane, we fail to arrive in the center of faithfulness, and we fail to be faithful with what God has given us. When we arrive in 1 Samuel 13, we see an incongruence between God's call on Saul's life and Saul's failure to rightly execute that call. 1 Samuel 13 is a quintessential example of what happens when we don't stay in our lane. This morning, I'd like to talk for a while out of this sermon entitled, you may know it, Stay in Your Lane. Walk with me around the text a bit. The first thing we notice in 1 Samuel 13 is Saul's desire for victory. He's a young king who after a probationary period is exalted to be the first king of Israel. We know the Bible tells us he's tall, dark, and handsome. He looks the part. They look up to him. And he's a young king. He's new to his post. He, he's new. He's trying to figure out the ropes, and he comes to a situation where he sees an opportunity to both serve God's people and have a win for himself. These two realities often go hand in hand, wanting and desiring to make a name for ourselves and wanting to serve people. So the Philistines who've haunted and harried the Israelite people, he goes against them and says, your number is up. So he musters 3,000 men. He keeps 2,000 himself. He sends his son to Gibeah with 1,000 and Jonathan and them boys rout the Philistines and they have a victory. Saul then takes this victory, touts it as his own, as an attempt to galvanize a fractured and a running people. Come and look what Saul has done. Come back and fight for God's people. And here from the rip, we see Saul borrowing other people's victory and parroting them as his own. Now, it would have been common for a king to do such a thing, and yet it's not lost on me that we begin to see a man who does not have the character of God to sustain the office that God placed him in. So Saul's ambitions for a successful military campaign lead him to galvanize, and the people come. But here it's important that Newton's third law comes into play, and I'm not a physicist by any means, and perhaps you know it, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. I'm by myself. That's okay. So after this victory, Jonathan, victory at Gibeah, and the Philistines come back with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and the text says troops that are like sand on the seashore. 
Saul's forces, where they were, would have seen them streaming into the valley. He would have seen them streaming in like ants on a Snickers. And as a leader, he would have been able to see this was a predictable L, a predictable loss. What began as a good idea for somewhat good reasons has led to what looks like the downfall of Israel. And as a leader, it is important to know that there have been many a battle lost because of a good idea. Now, listen, we all want to win. We all want to be successful. We want to be faithful with with what God has given us. We want successful pastorates. We want successful ministries. But friends, at what cost? Are we willing to spend the lives and spiritual health of those around us for an ego stroke? Are we willing to clout chase to make ourselves feel better and leave other people to by the wayside if we overinflate our success, even for the noblest of reasons? And if our obedience to God lags behind our desire for success, then your successes will be hollow, they will be damaging to others and costly to your soul. Here's the point. Stay in your lane, lest your desire to win lead others to ruin. Now, imagine you're the Israelites. You're feeling good coming off of a victory. You watch the Philistines file into the battleground, and there's literally nowhere to hide. The text tells us they're hiding in cisterns, they're hiding in graves, they're hiding in crevices of rocks because they are so afraid. You look at what seems to be an inevitable loss, and you are Saul, and your choice is do you trust God or will you take matters into your own hands? What we see next in the text is a deficiency of trust. Saul is deficient in trust in two areas. One, he doesn't trust Samuel to arrive on time. And second, he doesn't trust God. But friends, there's something even more important that Saul is lacking. Saul has forgotten where he is. If you look in verse 7, at the very end of verse 7, you will find the location of where this is happening. It's in a place called Gilgal. And friends, place in your Bible matters. This particular place is a special place. Gilgal is a holy place. When Joshua led the Israelites to the other side of the Jordan River, where was it that they crossed? At Gilgal. It was here when God cut the spigot off of the Jordan River and delivered them into the promised land. At Gilgal. It was Here, that when they crossed, they erected 12 stones, Ebenezer's, to remember the work that God had done here at Gilgal. And if you were to read Joshua chapter 4, verse 12, when the children ask, what are these stones for? Your response should be, these stones mean that the hand of the Lord is mighty so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Gilgal is a place where God has already proven to do the impossible. It's a place where God is already building his resume. It's a place where he's already showed his power in the face of insurmountable odds. And where is Saul? At Gilgal. God did at Gilgal what he's done all along, which is turn inevitable losses into impregnable victories. Friends, this is what he does. Should someone ask you, does God do some of his best work when it looks like sure defeat? You should reply back with, does the sun rise? You should reply back with, is rain wet? And you should reply with, will you want to quit Beeson after Dr. Ross's Hebrew 3 class? The answer to each of those is, of course. (laughs) 
Redemptive history is littered with God's work and his saving power against those who bring the strongest opposition. What did Joseph tell us? What the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. Moses shows us that God loves to deliver his people from certain death. Gideon showed us that God doesn't need big armies because he brings himself Shamgar shows us that the person with a stick who's faithful can defeat insurmountable odds with God on your side. And JL reveals that God's deliverance comes from surprising places. Now, if you were to back up into chapter 12 and look at verse 22, you would find God's already given Samuel a message for Saul going into his tenure. Samuel tells, tells Saul, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his name's sake. God puts his name and his reputation on the line. Who are we to say that it's our name and our reputation on the line? Because it pleases the Lord to make a people for himself. Friends, Saul knew better than to offer this sacrifice on the altar of the Lord. Saul knew better than to not trust God. And here's the reality. You should know better too. Have you forgotten Gilgal? Have you forgotten the places where God showed up? Have you forgotten God's faithfulness because you're a little bit worried or a little bit stressed? Saul didn't trust God. But Saul also didn't trust Samuel. Samuel tells him to wait seven days. Samuel comes up after Saul has offered his sacrifice in what is a hilarious scene to me. Because how often is it that just when we decide to do things ourselves, God comes through? Saul offers this sacrifice. And as soon as he does, the text reads, Samuel shows up and Saul goes out to greet him. And the first words out of Samuel's mouth is, what have you Now, I'm I'm, I'm reading between the lines here, but there's something happening where Samuel understands that Saul has done something rash. Saul is not a priest. Samuel is a priest. Samuel would have been familiar with the morning sacrifice of the lamb and the evening sacrifice of the lamb. As a priest, he would have been familiar with how to kill a lamb in the proper way so that not only is the sacrifice sufficient, but it doesn't ruin his garments every time he does. There are particular clothes that a priest puts on before he goes in to offer this sacrifice. There is a particular ritual that priests undergo to separate themselves so that they can uh, undergo and undertake this offering. But I wonder if Saul, taking matters into his own hands, very messily and very sloppily slits the throat of that lamb. He doesn't have the garments on. He doesn't know what he's doing. So he goes out to meet Samuel covered in blood. And Samuel looks at him and says, what have you done? But there's another aspect to this because I don't know if you've ever been to a bonfire before. But no one leaves a bonfire the same. Either you get a little too close to the fire and get singed, or at the very least, everyone walks away smelling like smoke. You can't burn a whole animal and not have the traces of scent that are on your clothes and your body. You can't smoke a rack of ribs without having smoke stick to you for two days. So I'm I'm reading between the lines here, but I imagine Saul walks out to greet Samuel. He not only sees him covered in blood, but he smells like burnt hair and flesh. And Samuel immediately knows that he's done something rash. What have you done? This pairing of king and priest is super crucial here in the text, but I think there's a word here for us. Because a leader who acts alone is a crisis. A leader who leads in isolation and alone, that, friends, is a crisis. Samuel is Saul's ace in the hole. 
It is Samuel's office as priest that will ensure that God's favor be upon this battle. And it's the very thing that Saul admits he didn't do. I did not seek the favor of the Lord. He didn't trust Samuel to show up on time. But Saul didn't trust God. And I get it. He's looking at over 50,000 men, horses, and chariots, and soldiers. He's looking at 3,000 of his own men. And y'all, the math ain't mathing. He's understood that the way to victory is to offer a sacrifice before God to curry his favor, and Samuel is late. And he didn't trust that the God of Gilgal in the time of Joshua is the same God of Gilgal here. Where in your own life does fear and pressure and a desire to look good in the others, in the eyes of others, cause you to take matters in your own hands? But here's perhaps the most damning thing about this text. Saul believes that an act of disobedience would be sufficient to curry the favor of God. I'm going to say that again. Saul believed that an act of disobedience was enough and sufficient to curry the favor of God. No amount of disobedience would cause a holy God to move. And so there's tension here. And the tension in the text is one many of us know well. It's the tension between what things look like and the way things are. There's tension here. Tension. Dr. Webster, you don't know anything about living in tension, do you? There's often tension between will we trust God or will we take matters into our own hands? And a sign of spiritual immaturity is resolving the tension too soon. And a sign of spiritual maturity is the willingness to live in that tension and let God resolve it. There is a couple aspects of spiritual maturity that we see on display here, and the first of which is a blatant disobedience that reveals a lack of trust in God. This disobedience, if you were to look in the text, Saul says, I forced myself. You forced yourself. You made yourself do something against your will. Literally, I moved through the discomfort of passing my boundaries as if God were impressed that you somehow made yourself cross your own boundaries. This act of disobedience isn't enough. And I think what's here And what Saul would have done well to remember is that God rarely ever appoints someone to be a leader without complimentary people around them. And a leader alone is in a crisis. The greatest gift for me as a senior pastor, first time senior pastor, have been men around me to carry the load and for me to trust them in the ways that God has designed them and not me. Because friends, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And here in the text, there is a sense in which had Saul trusted Samuel to be who God called him to be, we would not be here. But there's a second sign of immaturity, and that's blame shifting. Saul blames three different groups of people before he finally says, I forced myself to do this. Now, I want you to look when he confronts Samuel, or Saul rather, in verse 11. Saul says, when I saw the people were scattering from me. So the first thing is the people's fault. And then I saw that you didn't come within the days appointed. Secondly, it's your fault. And then that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash. It's their fault. The spiritual immaturity of blame shifting is on display, just like Adam. It was the woman that you gave me. Just like Eve, it was the serpent who deceived me. And what are the consequences? The consequences are that God strips his kingship from him. Now, here, 
it's important for us to note that God and Beyonce are singing off the same sheet of music. And it's true for us in this room, don't you ever for a second get to thinking. Y'all know it, it's fine, we in chapel, you ain't got to say it, that you're irreplaceable. Friends, I think one of the greatest failures that I have in the battle that I fight is that somehow I am indispensable to God's mission on earth. And I function as if God needs me, but more sinister. And I want you to hear this, and I'm saying this for me. Friends, there are no vacancies in the Trinity. And that none of us, no matter how good our deeds or how impressive our preaching, no matter how efficient or sufficient our work and leadership is, God is God. Disobey if you want to and see what God does. And what does he do here? He strips his kingdom from him. And at the same time, God shows us the dire consequences when we disobey. In verse 2, we find that Saul has 3,000 troops. 2,000 with him and 1,000 with Jonathan and Gibeah. And by the time we get to chapter 13, verse 15, if you look at the very end of verse 15, how many troops are left? 600. He enters the battle with 3,000 men and he leaves Gilgal, having sullied a holy place with 600 people. Friends, here's the point. Stay in your lane, lest your spiritual immaturity disqualify you from future blessings. I'm rounding third and coming home. It would be a very unchristian sermon if we did not somehow find hope in the gloom here. And the hope is in what God has prepared both for Israel and for us in a prince that he raises up. And we see that God raises a prince. It's interesting that the text doesn't tell us he raises a king. He's raised a leader. He's raised a man who knows that Israel doesn't need a king. They already have one. His name is Yahweh. And this king, this leader, this prince would be a man after God's heart, a man who would be after the things of the Lord. And we know, we're good biblical scholars, that the immediate fulfillment of this text is the shepherd boy David. But the ultimate fulfillment of this text is Jesus. It's only Jesus who not only is after the heart of God, but has the heart of God because he is God. And he comes as a prince, though a king, not to point attention to himself, but to point others to the Father. And it's because of his faithful service that he was coronated through and by his suffering to be king. And God placed the highest name upon him. Friends, Jesus stayed in his lane. Jesus stayed in his lane. God had a plan for him and he worked that plan. He could have hopped out of his lane for comfort, but he didn't. He could have called angels down in that wilderness, but he didn't. He could have succumbed to his mother's summons outside of that house. He didn't. He could have gone to Bethany two days earlier to save Lazarus, but he didn't. He could have rejected God's plan in the garden. He didn't. He could have taken the word from the jeering crowd upon a cross and unhooked himself, but he didn't because to stay in his lane would have meant eternal blessing for us and to get out would have meant eternal horror. He is the morning sacrifice of the lamb hung on the cross in the morning. He is the evening sacrifice of the lamb who took his last breath at night. He is the lamb who was slain as the all-sufficient atonement for our sin and the one who secures victory against our enemies. Bless his name. I told you earlier that Gilgal was a special place, but Saul puts a black mark on this special place. No longer is it synonymous solely with God's saving power. It's now got a black mark on it about Saul's disobedience. But God is a redeeming God. He turns every place into a Gilgal. Take Gethsemane. It's a garden. It's a garden that could have marked destruction. But he turns Gethsemane into Gilgal, a place to remind us where Jesus counted the cost of your salvation. He turned Golgotha, 
a, a place of death into Gilgal, a place to remind us of the lengths to which God was willing to go to save our souls. And he turns the grave into Gilgal. Once a symbol of finality and separation from God is now a reminder that death can't hold a good man down. All so that he can turn glory into Gilgal, a series of eternal monuments to God's saving power upon the nations. Friends, here's the point. Stay in your lane and let God cook. Here's the truth. This is the thrust. I'm, I'm rounding third and coming home. This is the whole point of this sermon. It's so simple, but this is the point. Trust God. That's it. Not eloquent, not sophisticated, but absolutely essential. Trust God. Friends, where is Gilgal for you? Where are your stones? Go back to Gilgal in your own life and remember how God was faithful. Remember when he made a way out of no way. Remember when he picked you up, set you on your solid feet, turned you around. Remember when he changed your life. Remember when he called you to himself. Remember that God can be trusted. Trust God. Trust God when your gifts feel out of place. Trust God when you're trying to find your voice. Trust God when you're outnumbered. Trust God when you think failure is imminent. Trust God when you're tempted to take matters into your own hands. Trust God when the math ain't mathing and the numbers don't add up. Trust God when your child can't get right. Trust God when you lose your job. Trust God when you lose your spouse. Trust God when you think that you can't find another job. Trust God when you're behind in Greek. Trust God when you're between posts. Trust God when it's tuition time and you're trying to rub two nickels together to make 15 cents. Trust God when your marriage is falling apart. Trust God when you're in a dry place spiritually. Trust God when you're in Gibeah. Trust God when you're at Golgotha. Trust God that failure ain't final. And trust God that he'll turn your Gilgal for his glory. Hallelujah. Here's the point. Trust God and stay in your lane. 